This BOF Live is brought to you in partnership with Linkfluence, a leader in consumer intelligence, enabling global brands to derive actionable insights from social data. Learn more at Linkfluence.com. Good afternoon, good morning, and welcome to BOF Live and what I'm sure will be an insightful and informative conversation on how brands and businesses can tap into global social media trends. To help shed light on the challenges and opportunities facing fashion businesses, I'm delighted to be joined by Benjamin Duval of Linkfluence, who has over a decade of experience on this subject matter, having set up his own influencer company in China in 2009, which later pivoted to become a social listening company, which he sold to Linkfluence, a meltwater company, becoming their chief evangelist. Benjamin, thank you so much for being here today. My pleasure. Benjamin joins us from North Carolina, um, and he will also be sharing insights from Linkfluence's recently published report, The New Era of Fashion, which flows millions of user-generated posts on social media across things like Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Xena, Weibo, Little Red Book, through their proprietary social listening software to identify key drivers for the industry. I also have the pleasure of welcoming Pablo Moron, the Managing Director and Partner of the Digital Luxury Group. Thank you for being here, Pablo, especially at 11 p.m. in Shanghai. Hey, Robin, it's great to be here. Thank you. Thank you again for joining so late. Uh, Pablo, Pablo's team manages 360-degree digital and consulting projects for major luxury brands in various sectors, including Mont Blanc, Four Seasons, Christian Louboutin, and Landmark, among many others. Um, you know, Ben and Pablo have both been, having spent time in China, they have both had a front row seat to the evolution of social media and where we are now today witnessing new commercial dynamics between brands and the platforms, compelling new behavioral trends, as well as significant technolog technological developments, which are transforming how consumers interact with luxury and fashion businesses through mobile and social commerce and how well we understand that interaction. From the verticalization of niche communities exemplified by platforms like Billy Billy to the viral success of UGC content pioneered by Doyen and then later TikTok in the West. The majority of innovation in social media and social media trends stems from China where, thanks to its mobile first consumer cohorts and differing cultural attitudes to data sharing, its digital ecosystem and super apps like WeChat are more connected, more personalized and more developed than those in the West. Indeed, China is the undisputed epicenter of this innovation. For example, last year, Facebook and Google both announced that they were going to be following in the wake of WeChat and creating super app type structures to combine their portfolios of apps, just to give you an indication of the kind of influence Chinese trends can have. But what are the most significant social media trends that are impacting retail today and how can businesses tap into them? I wanna start by talking first about some of the big trends that we're, we're seeing in the market in terms of format, topic, cadence, et cetera. And, you know, one of the, the biggest trends we've seen, obviously, is video consumption. I think in 2020, 96% of consumers increased online video consumption to up to 100 minutes a day um, per person. So, Ben, you know, starting with you, when we think about some of the big shifts when it comes to interaction with social media content online, what do you think are the most significant trends, be it video or anything else? Yeah, <clears throat> thanks for kicking off. Um, first of all, I just want to say we're, I'm super happy to be here. Um, you gave us a quick introduction. Um, you know, Linkfluence, uh, you know, is, is really focused on following the new data trends because all of the insight that we gather is based on data, garbage in, garbage out, right? So, um, you know, we actually bring in hundreds of billions of data sources around the world. Douyin, you mentioned being one, but another one might be some university BBS in Taiwan or in, in Guangzhou. So the data is crucially important to us. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about the AI later. In terms of trends, um, you're absolutely right. China has been you know, a huge pioneer and a lot of people point back to you know, Mark Zuckerberg's statement a few years ago saying, if I'd only known earlier the, the direction that WeChat was going to go into. Um, but you know the lockdowns, uh, last last year and, and still continuing in many parts of the world, which have changed in the U.S., have really accelerated the uh, proliferation of, of video and video platforms. Um, we saw this as you know as early as actually three four years ago when there were hundreds of live streaming apps that were coming out and it was just a red ocean. Um, and of course, Douyin and TikTok in the West have kind of filtered to the top, um, but that's completely changed the way that. That consumers share now. Um, short video format is um, 
you know, by far and above the most uh, engaged format uh, today. It's what consumers look for. Um, you know, the, the infinite scroll has become basically a standard. And I think what brands are struggling with now in the U.S., which you mentioned, commercialization of that format. Um, you know, still there's many brands who focus on uh, Instagram because they believe that they can use um, the uh, ad formats and the commercial formats of Instagram and Facebook to convert, whereas TikTok is a little bit more difficult to understand. Um, and in China, on the other hand, we've had integration of commercial features since you know five, six years ago. So I think there's still a lot of room to be done in the West, um, whereas in the China, there's, there's been a lot of empowerment. And of course, uh, video is at the forefront. Pablo, you work with leading brands. From the brand side, you know, what have you seen as to be the most significant trends that they are either tapping or missing? Short, short video, as you said, is definitely the first one that comes to mind. I mean, just, just to share a few numbers uh, in regards to that. Um, Chinese users spend now the most time per day on short video ads, surpassing instant messaging or mobile games. Uh, and that was released on for the re recent uh, Q2 data, 30% of user time is spent on average watching short videos. Um, short videos in China reach 905 million uh, active users, uh, monthly active users, penetration rate of close to 80%. Uh, it became a global phenomenon. And what it means is that at the beginning, we're watching Douyin and, and the key question for luxury brands at, at, at the inception stage of Douyin was definitely in terms of the relevancy it has, in terms of the positioning, positioning it as and whether it was right. And at first, it started by an assumption or maybe not an assumption, it was factual, that it was highly popular and with a high penetration rate among a young audience. That is obviously a very strategic segment in China, but now it's becoming a global phenomenon. Uh, and and, and as, as Ben very rightfully said, one of the key thing linked to that is the fact that when the short video boom happened in China, there was already e-commerce integration in place. It evolved. Uh, at the beginning, Douyin really made an impact as a very performing traffic driver towards Tmall. Now with their ambition of, of, uh, of becoming a legitimate e-commerce contender, and they have a very strong uh, ambition related to that, the mechanism has changed. There is now even the possibility to have your own flagship store into Douyin. And so that short video, um, which is not anymore a new phenomenon, but, but became also truly integrated as part of a consumer journey. Uh, and, and that's a, a massive change for brands in terms of how to approach a platform like that. How has the short video boom or the popularity of short video impacted the influencer and KOL trend or economy that we saw emerging? You know, obviously there are short video influencers and, and um, KOLs, but there, it, it is a distinct type of consumption. Ben, perhaps you have some thoughts. Yeah, I mean, it's only accelerated and democratized, um, you know, ac access to, to making money. Um, you know, previously, you know, if you looked at the influencer economy, people were talking about macro influencers. Um, I actually, you know, the influencer company that you started, that you mentioned earlier that I started around 2007, 2008, was a grassroots influencer marketing company. Um, we did activations, campaigns of 5,000, 10,000 influencers at a time. Um, but we kept on getting pigeonholed as kind of a field marketing or a sampling agency because we were kind of 10 years ahead. It wasn't really until... Uh, individual streamers and creators are able to uh, to commercialize on that themselves through the tools that the platforms integrated um, that this is able to happen. And that's really responsible for, you know, a company like ByteDance completely kind of coming out of nowhere in the last couple of years and becoming one of the big four in China. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a fundamental, um, you know, it, it's a fundamental phenomenon that we've seen over and over again, which is, you know, access to attention, you know, access to capital um, and, the, and the ability to uh, to share content and, and to, to share creativity in a way that's uh, never been possible before. And of course, the constant uh, war between um, the platforms capturing their fair share of that. I, I think, Benny, if I can, um, you mentioned uh, grassroots marketing and, and, and I think that that's really a key thing. And, and this is what Doing and, and now we're talking about short video, but to some extent we'll talk about red as well. Uh, but, but this is a topic and, and 
I've, I've been in China for 10 years now. I actually don't even know if grassroots marketing is really a thing outside of China. Uh, but, but it's true that if you look at it historically, the way luxury brands would work with influencers was mostly targeted at the top tier. Very top tier influencers, one-off activities, supporting of campaign. And, and, and Doin and, and Sharon Chu rather, um, I've, I've really brought to luxury brands that concept of grassroots marketing that was much less present on other social media platforms because of the power of those smaller micro influencers, no matter if you call them micro niche or key opinion customers, KOCs. Uh, and, and that became a new thing for those brands, realizing the importance also of, 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 of having that amount of repetitions and, and somehow contributing to shape the word of mouth. Um, and, and, and that's something very interesting that was definitely brought by those new trends. And, and that also corresponds to the consumer that is evolving and that is looking for a content that can be in some cases a little bit more raw, more relatable, more genuine. Uh, and, and, and that's definitely fully aligned with those big trends. Thinking about yeah. how, sorry, Ben. No, I just wanted to bounce back on that because, um, you know, I, if you think about it, there really has been a shift. Um, I think more, at least into the middle tier of influencers. You know, I remember a few years back that we used to have this phenomenon called the J. Cho uh, Sunday, right? Where it was like, they show on, on fried chicken, on sneakers, um, on luxury wristwatch, on this, that, and the other. And there was no real um, you know, synergy between the personality of the influencer and the relatability of that person to their audience and their, their group of people or their tribe and what the brand's personality was. It was just a pure media buy. You know, it was like, who is the big Mendo pop star or the actor that, that we can purchase to buy media to access the social channel. Um, and now because of you know, a lot of what Pablo was saying, can't really get away with that as much. Um, it's, it's still, I, I think, probably a critical piece of the mix, but I think there's a lot more attention to um, you know, this concept of trust and relatability and authenticity. And um, I'm not sure if that goes, you know, follows through, through the commercials. Um, you know, does that actually drive purchase at the end of the day? Versus having, you know, someone who can sell 10,000, you know, lipsticks, uh, Maybelline, you know, in, in one, uh, you know, live stream, which you've seen some phenomenon like that happen. Um, but I definitely think if we look at the inspiration for trends and the way that's affected consumers, it definitely has become a lot more grassroots. Thinking about talking about authenticity and tribes, it seems that we're at a juncture where on the one hand, you have the democratization, that short term, short form video and far greater numbers of individuals that are creators and contributing to this economy is creating. But you also have, and it doesn't necessarily mean it's small in scale, but very niche communities, communities that can find themselves potentially at scale, but built around these small, very, very specific interest points. We're also at a stage where despite global, despite the impact and the travel bans of COVID-19, we are still uh, the, more, the most global society we have ever been. Do you see any trends when it comes to topics or something beyond format, beyond videos, but you know, when it comes to interests or topics or types of interactions that are emerging, can you see that we may be on the precipice of global social media trends that relate to identity or relate to activity as opposed to formats that perhaps we might not have been previously? Do you want to go, Ben? Uh, yeah, I'm I can sure. try. Um, oh, please, Ben, sorry. <laughs> no, Pablo, I was about to let you, let, let you go first. Let's go back. You go ahead. And you're the expert okay. in the luxury field, so I don't want to step on the thing before you, before no. you talk. <laughs> uh, no, no, but um, I, I'm not sure it directly um, uh, address your point, but on, on that topic of empowering users and, and, and allowing them to become truly content creators. Um, because the fact is that before Douyin and Red in China, users were not really content creators, right? Um, and if we look at UGC and what it means today and the dimension that it is taking, what, what I love to look at is, is the, the dimension that Red has developed in, in, in literally becoming a review platform. And, and, and this is where Red plays a massive role in the market where people go there or 
as well to spot new trends and be inspired and that very kind of top of the funnel uh, type of content. But Red also plays a very strategic role when it comes to reassurance, when it comes to confirming an act of purchase. And, and there is a whole category of UGC that, that you can observe on other platforms, but I feel that Red is the one that, that really embodies that. Unboxing video, people sharing their experience of, of unboxing their latest purchase, people showing how they're going to wear it, how they're going to style it, publishing their reviews about it, and going to like significant level of details, positive or negative for that matter. Um, oh, sorry, I see a few questions. We're, we're talking, and yes, it's a bit confusing. We're talking about Little Red Book, also known as Red. Um, that, that's the platform I was talking about. And, and so I, I think that's an interesting dimension because I think that previously we would look at content creators that were mostly people with, with a creative approach. Uh, and, and now we see people that showcase a knowledge through tutorials, or again, simply consumers that are expressing a point of view and sharing an experience. And, and this is very interesting. And I just want to pick up on a question from Nina. Um, well, I, I will we'll, we'll, we'll follow up with spelling of Little Red Book, but um, Nina's asked how small brands can reach out to get engagement in this shift in, in landscape. And as I was very complicatedly explaining, you know, but we are at a, at a shift where there are many more content creators. You don't have to go to the traditional macro influencers, you know, in this transitional period, is there any advice or do you see area, any areas of opportunities that will enable design businesses to break through the noise? Or is there an opportunity for them to reach consumers that wasn't there before? Ben, do you want to perhaps kick this one off? Yeah, I mean, it's a paradoxical time. Um, in one way, it's a better time than ever because there's new platforms that are coming out all the time. I think there's investment capital in these platforms that are willing to wait to figure out how to commercialize those. And that's an opportunity always for small businesses and people to get their content out there uh, before uh, they become you know, uh, inundated or the field starts to be controlled with advertisements or the attention starts to be monetized and filtered in certain ways. There's been a lot of criticism uh, for platforms like Facebook, for example, um, a lot of brands having pulled out completely because um, you know, they, just, they don't believe that um, they're getting the return on their investment for that platform nor do they believe that it's become, you know, it's really evolved into a place where people can organically share content. Um, China in many ways is still the, still the wild west. Um, and even though, you know, things are starting to become more concrete, like platforms like Red have now been around for a while, um, there's still this um, sense of accessibility. So, um, you know, connecting without having to pay through the nose for macro influencers, um, creating a strong brand proposition and a strong story where you relate to a tribe, a group of people who have psychographic, not demographic connections, who are, are passionate about something and building a relationship with them and using some of the fundamental tactics of, of grassroots marketing, influencer seeding, um, CRM, um, and basically empowering these people to own your brand. There's been many stories, not just in the West, or, or, um, not just in China, but also in the West. White Claw is one example of a brand that rode, you know, the, the boom of the hard seltzer industry and basically let the consumers own their brand and empowered them to do so through seeding and events and kind of grassroots tactics. So I think it's a better time than ever. The specific example is a B2B example, which is always more challenging. But within the case of design, I mean, that's a phenomenal opportunity to showcase. Um, so, you know, I would, I would encourage... Um, you know, this person to, uh, to get out there, um, understand the people who are in their tribe, uh, what are the passion points of that tribe, and, and try to engage with that with product creating and live content. Pablo, do you if want I to can add up on, yeah, if I can add up on that topic, I feel that if we're looking at potential alternatives, on, on, especially if we're talking about brands that are at a market entry level or that are still at the focus where they need to build their awareness, with, with not necessarily investment available to, to tick all the boxes. Um, again, what those trends that we're talking about are bringing in terms of opportunity is that in the past, influencer marketing was mostly perceived as something that would be here as an, as an amplificator role. Uh, you would be here with your official account and the influencer marketing would be also measured in terms of ROI on how it benefits to you. 
Um, but on platforms like Red, again, what, what you see is that the word of mouth and the UGC is, is even more impactful potentially than what you are gonna achieve through your own account. And, and, and we know that one of the key challenges in China is, is the cost related to, to content production. Um, I mean, agencies like us, our job is, is to do the best out of what is already available from headquarters. But once you start to see on how to fill the gaps, when you start to look at the amount of work, no matter the quantity or the quality of the assets available, required to copywriting, regarding to reworking the different assets, it can be very significant. What is interesting with platforms like Red is that a seeding strategy can be a thing in itself. Uh, and, and if you look at th those stories that we love about overnight success of brands that enter the market, most of the time what you see is that it looks like an overnight success, but it wasn't. Because by the time those brands arrive, you see purchase intentions that were steadily growing on Tmall for two or three years before they actually enter. And, and in some cases, the, the work gets done by magic based on the popularity of the brand, based on the influence of what they do overseas. But in some other cases, there's going to be a need to initiate that. And, and this is where, again, the, those seeding strategy that Benjamin was mentioning becomes highly relevant. Now, when you are an high-end luxury watch brand, it's quite difficult to do seeding. Um, but, but again, what you're trying to work with is, is micro-influencers, is, is people that are going to be flattered and enthusiastic about working with the brand. Inviting them to a store to take pictures can be a good enough reward. Uh, staging events, and that's also what ties back to the power of, uh, of experiential marketing, pop-up events, and so on, because those become a massive source to stimulate that user-generated content. Um, we do. Oh gosh, sorry. Excuse me. We do have to move on to the next part. But just one, whilst we're in this sort of um, community advice section, Adita has asked. Um, you know, as you mentioned, relying on UGC or utilizing UGC, I should say, it, um, adds a level of regional complexity to brands that are trying to make global impacts and also do that effectively. You know, you can't be all things to all people. How would you advise? people trying to utilize social media to reach consumers in different geographies to build that sort of strategy that's going to reflect localized preferences, but also build a brand of global impact? Yeah, I mean, what a phenomenal question. Um, I think this question is really at the heart of relatability um, and risk in terms of brand equity, specifically for the fashion industry. Um, there are many industries that you know, over the last five or 10 years have learned to strike a balance between uh, local brand management or marketing communications and the risk of kind of letting go of their brand. And to be frank, you know, most luxury brands have not been so great at this or they have just purposely decided that they would like to create a sense of aloofness in the brand, um, which is part of their equity, which is fair enough. But suffice to say, um, it's been very difficult for consumers to find that type of ownership over a brand. And this is really probably goes to later in the conversation, but this is really where tools come into play. Both mm -hmm. CRM tools, uh, Meltwater, for example, has a tool called Clear, which is an influencer management tool, um, as well as, uh, as tracking tools. Um, and I think what's most important about this, starting on the, on the tracking side or the insight side, is understanding which people in your tribe actually relate to the personality, the fundamental personality of your brand. What is your brand personality? And are you seeding your product with people that really epitomize and represent that? And can you provide them with a little bit of trust? You know, if, even if you choose like some, you know, Canto pop star as your brand advocate, they could always drive their Lamborghini off the bridge or get arrested for smoking dope, right? That, that can always happen and has happened. Um, but if you take a seating approach and you go with many influencers and you have the technology to be able to understand, you know, what are the personality traits of those people? What tribe do they fit into? And you look at the aggregate, you know, impact on that tribe, you have a little bit less of risk exposure and you also have a more diversified footprint um, that is more organic. So this is, I mean, this is really the crux I think of the fashion industry is who owns the brand Consumers are, whether you like it or not, are going to, you know, believe they own their brand and more and more because of democratization, they're going to be pushing that forward. And there's a balance there between, uh, you know, 
what what you want the brand to be and what it's going to become in the hearts and minds of consumers. Pablo, do you want to pass on? If not, I'll jump on, I'll, I'll carry on. Um, something that we haven't discussed yet, and it's picking actually up on, on the tools that I know we're going to go into more detail in a few minutes on, Ben, so thanks for introducing that. But, you know, part of the reason why various tools are becoming increasingly critical is that the relationship between social media platforms and the businesses and brands that are on them has changed quite dramatically with the release of shoppable content. You know, what were once collaborative relationships have now become platforms that want to own the entire customer journey that clearly, as you say, have huge e-commerce ambitions of their own. And I just want to spend a few minutes now talking about how brands can navigate some of those new dynamics and, and what, they can, what they can do to utilize platforms appropriately. So, Pablo, perhaps you can just kick off by sharing what your thoughts are on, on the reality of that shift in dynamic and, and what individuals can do if they don't have the clout of Hermes, should we say, but I'm sure even Hermes is now subject to the power of these yeah, brands. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is this is a massive topic, obviously. And um, when it comes to social commerce, first off, there's a very clear statement to be made. There is not a single social media platform in China that doesn't have either a strong e-commerce integration or their own transactional capabilities, all of them with more or less success, but all of them are it. That, and, and that definitely changes the paradigm of how you approach those platforms. Um, again, Ch China is not a market where people browse online and jump from one website to another. Uh, and so that, that, that leads to a consumer journey that historically and maybe still for some time remains quite fragmented. You have those platforms that you're gonna position at an awareness role, uh, at an awareness level. You're gonna have those platforms that you position more at a research interest level. You're gonna have those platforms that you position more at a purchase or at a loyalty level. What is happening now with that convergence that happened between social and commerce, social media becoming transactional and e-commerce platform turning themselves into social and entertainment platforms. It completely redefines the consumer journey in the way that now it can go from awareness deep down to purchase and eventually loyalty within a, a very same platform. Um, and, 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 obviously, so, and I think that that's the first stage of what we call social commerce. The second stage uh, is that concept that was brought by WeChat with that concept of private domain. Um, on, on, on WeChat, there is that idea that you're gonna build a community that you're gonna be able to activate at will without having to rely on media investments and so on. And, and this is what made WeChat so relevant to be positioned more or less as the cornerstone of what a true DTC uh, presence in China could be by opposition to Tmall, which would be more B2B2C. Um, and, and so WeChat brought that concept of private domain and, and they did that also through mini programs, right? Those fully interactive light apps that could be directly executed without download. What we're observing now is a, is a, is a broad adoption of mini programs across platforms. Uh, we saw Louis Vuitton followed by uh, Bulgari and Berluti launching stores on Jingdong. And when people search on Jingdong, they arrive on a fully branded mini program. I do offers mini program, Tmall offers mini program. What it gives to brand now is an opportunity to design a shopping experience that is 100% controlled by them. You don't have any more that, that old fear that the luxury industry had about Tmall, which is, oh, I don't want my product to be displayed nearby the rice cooker. And, and, and this, is a, this is a massive thing because that means that every investment you are going to do at the top of the funnel eventually will be able to be directly measured in terms of concrete sales ROI. Because revenue attribution is still a challenge right now, especially when you're on a market where people jump in between apps rather than, I mean, China has been cookie-less forever. Um, and, and so that address issues related to revenue attribution uh, that, that creates opportunities to turn every single touch point into a potential transactional one. But all those great opportunities come also with very high requirements in terms of how you're going to measure the performance, how you're going to unify customers' profile. And this is super exciting, super exciting. Ben, we're at a time now where the 
barriers to entrepreneurship are lower than ever. You know, there's off the shelf solutions to a lot of the challenges that previously were very costly. But similarly, it's, you know, the actual channels through which retail are being executed are consolidating, getting very consolidated in few hands. You know, with a social listening data company that is, you know, your business is focused on the data that this all creates. What do you see as the greatest loss that this new dynamic has created for brands and businesses in terms of how they used to understand their customers through their relationships with the platforms in the past? Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. It's related to Pablo's answer. I mean, when there are closed pockets of communities that are managed by brands, um, it does create some challenges in order it uh, does create some challenges to data capture, but I think the biggest challenge is the perception that marketers have that everything is happening in those specific domains. Um, and, and that's simply not the case. I mean, one thing that's happened in social listening over the last few years is this data agnostic approach where social listening isn't really a good term to define the industry anymore at all. Um, AI enabled consumer intelligence is really a better term because we're having a unified data approach. So we're, we're bringing in those sources, those review sources um, from those platforms. Um, we're bringing in first party data from, that might come from uh, surveys that are run by brands within their closed platforms. Um, and we're integrating data that's on all of those long tail platforms where the kind of weak signals are happening, where the early trends are happening, where there, you create opportunities which could really um, for some industries like hygiene, for example, innovation can completely, you know, leapfrog your competitors or within fashion, you can have a way to connect consumers in ways that other brands aren't in their close community. So I think if, if marketers just look at, for example, Taobao and they're like, this is, um, you know, or, or a single platform and they're like, you've got the whole funnel here, just focus everything here um, and not bring in that vast amount of data sources. Um, then you're, you're missing opportunities. Um, and those opportunities go across the business. So uh, we were just talking about commercialization, but there's opportunities when you look at reviews for quality control. In China, there's opportunities for um, grade mark, gray market, like trademark infringement detection, things like this that go to various aspects of the, of the business. And all of that, that investment in data scales infinitely. Once you have it and you have it in the platform, you can use it for tracking your commercialization through the funnel. So, um, and, and you can use it for detecting signals. So I think the, the biggest tragedy is really probably like a perceived, um, you know, the perception that everything is happening just in these, you know, four big giants where it's actually more complex than that. When we think about, um, if we think the, you know, one of the most exciting things about the application of AI enabled customer intelligence is how rich a data set fashion has when it can, and now it can be tapped, especially with the onset of photo vision, I believe is the term for it. You know, fashion plays a distinct role in our identity. People, I, you know, intentionally express themselves through fashion products, creating a, you know, a treasure trove of very rich data that is accessible. Can you tell me about some of the exciting applications you see for some of the insights that are coming out of us suddenly being able to tap this huge data agnostic understanding of, 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 of um, how people interact with fashion and luxury products? I know you mentioned the gray market and the commercialization through your funnel, but are there anything else that you think is particularly exciting or compelling? Yeah, I mean, again, it's connected to what Pablo was saying. I think about the proliferation of, um, of, of creative content, video content, um, and more, more authentic imagery that's coming up from everyday consumers, not just brands or, uh, or macro, macro influencers. Um, in terms of technology, the human, like a marketer or a data analyst, or even someone who is at corporate comms, there's no way that this person, because of human limitations, can sift through hundreds of thousands or millions of posts. Um, you can do, you can use classical approaches to try to understand what are the, the main usage occasions, what's driving purchase, what's driving awareness, um, these type of things. But 
there's so much um, data online and just the pure statistical significance of it means that there are going to be opportunities in the, in the long tails that cannot be picked up. So I'll give you two examples. Um, if, I'll first I'll answer the, the, uh, the question that you had about computer vision. If you just simply look at, you know, have, you have a, a scroll that brings in all maybe the top 100 uh, images that come in. As an analyst or as a marketer, you can scroll through them and you can get some ideas. Okay, futurism is big in China. There's a lot of, um, you know, digital design in, um, in, in consumer posts. That's really interesting. But what you can't tell are what are the various environments um, that people are taking their, their photographs in? Are they outdoors or indoors? Are they at festivals? Are they at clubs? Are they at parties? Um, you can get some kind of like anecdotal uh, idea, but you cannot get a, a real uh, finite understanding of those occasions or the data that drives them. Computer vision, for example, can pick up you know, the top 15 environments that people are consuming your product in or are showcasing your product. What kind of logos are being used? What are other products from other industries that are being used in that? What are the genders of the people or the, the identified genders of the people that are being used in those photos? Um, who are the individual influencers or ambassadors? There's, um, you know, a luxury, there's actually a fast fashion brand we work with that has over 50,000 brand ambassadors. And the ability to use facial recognition to pick up those individuals where their content is being shared and just to look at those analytics is extremely powerful. So brands now actually have the ability to have kind of a Bloomberg terminal of insight that gives them data-driven insights that can match their explorative, kind of their anecdotal approach. Um, and that's, that's really a must have. Um, the other example I wanna give you is this kind of this old idea of the word cloud. It's been around for 10 years in social listening. And for some reason, it's really had legs uh, social media managers love to see it. And basically word cloud is you just see the top ranking words that appear in terms of volume. Um, one thing that can be done with AI is actually look at, kind of create a difference cloud where you look at the words that are not appearing as active in your entire data set and are correlated to the search. So for example, if you're just looking to at men wearing makeup at Christmas time, for example, and and you have a word cloud that shows only the words that appear for that data set and takes out all of the other junk, you can start to detect new trends around very small kind of micro, um, you know, themes that are coming up in the data. So, um, you know, I think computer vision is part of it, but the entire AI framework is, is creating a very effective tool and useful tool for consumer insight professionals and people throughout the organization to kind of tap into that power of data really quickly. And as like a last point, I feel like the luxury industry really has a lot to benefit from this because of what I had talked about before of the typically top down management of the brand and this concern of consumers owning their brand. Um, the ability to just look at and see what kind of trends are coming up. Um, and then to, to basically feed that into an artist or a designer consideration, even though design and luxury comes from the heart, is something that shouldn't be left behind because it's it's really tapping into the, those consumer trends. So um, yeah, I don't I don't want to monopolize. I know Pablo, we talked a little bit about before is kind of AI being more in our, in our part, but you're based in China. I'd love to hear kind of what you feel the opportunity is for for luxury brands as well, given this kind of traditional top down perspective and your obvious passion for grassroots. Uh, no, but I, I think that you, you you were talking about the data sets that is obviously expanding. And, 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 and what I found interesting, and, and again, I think it started with WeChat and then it really expanded. But, but it goes back to that idea of building as, as rich as possible picture of your consumers uh, at, at an individual level or by segment. And, and, and one of the key components that I think was definitely ahead in China was that idea of social CRM, that idea of starting to be able to identify and, 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 and reach consumers' profile, not only post-purchase, but already at a lead or at a prospect level, and, and being able to qualify them based on their behavior, based on their activities, based on their preference. And, and, and I think that... It expanded over time uh, through development of WeChat mini programs, tracking official uh, activities on WeChat official accounts, 
integrating with other social platforms, exposing an API. And once you start to be able to bind one ID that in China is traditionally speaking your mobile phone, because your mobile phone is your digital passport, on the contrary of the West, where we're going to use email to sign up to, to applications. Once you manage to bind that one ID with all the touch points where the user is active, you get such a detailed picture of, of what that person lo is looking at. And once you put all of that together and that you got an AI that gets trained in analyzing that, in, in terms of being able to do predictive modeling, identifying patterns, it goes beyond the inside. I think that there is a massive opportunity to directly have a strong impact on the impact made by the media planning and the media buying. And, and this is why there is that entire thing now on how to connect a CDP, like a, a real consumer data pool with uh, the DSP and, and being able to make a deep impact from all those data points and touch points that are gonna be gathered to develop smarter advertising and smarter distribution. And, and, and that, this, is, this is very interesting, I think. Pablo, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come to you in two seconds and ask, you know, we've spoken about a lot today and there's a, a big variety of, of individuals watching in our community. Um, and as we come to the last couple of minutes, please do ask any questions that remain. But Pablo, what do you think the most important thing to take away is for smaller brands from all of this conversation without the resources and access of, of others perhaps. But to give you a couple of seconds to think about that, then I'm, I'm gonna finish with you. And I, I think it would be really interesting to hear from you once Pablo has given his answer as to what you think the most important thing is for the luxury and fashion industries to take away from this conversation at a, as a whole, given when we've been preparing for this conversation, I know we spoke about how the beverage industry and the sports industry are all utilizing some of these tools in a, in a slightly more pioneering way. But Pablo, perhaps you could close out with some advice for, for those without the deep pockets of some, of some brands. That might not be the answer they expect, but first off, I think you need to have somehow deep pockets in China. Um, and, and obviously this is the agency guy talking, but I, I don't want to entertain an idea that with great content and by being smarter than others, you're going to be able to make it overnight. Uh, we were talking about the difference between social media in China and the, and the West and the fact that, that e-commerce integration is a, is a must have. Something that struck me from the moment I landed in, in China 10 years ago to now, in the West, you see new platforms that grow. And once they have the user base, you start to hear that they're struggling with their monetization and their business model. Like I've never seen an online platform in China that didn't have a business model. And they are built in a way that is, they're gonna do everything they can to force you to spend money. Like when, when Weibo started to see that advertising budgets were shifting to celebrities and KOLs, they started to apply a fee on celebrity posts that if you wouldn't pay, the celebrity post would only have 10% of its usual reach. Um, Sha Hongshu does the same. If a collaboration with a KOL or a celebrity is reported, the KOL or the collaboration has to pay a fee for that, that obviously gets charged to the brand. In exchange of what, the brand can be tagged. So we talk about all those things that are very exciting, but the reality is that the amount of content that needs to be produced is significant. That's a fact. Producing content for WeChat comes at a cost. Going on Douyin, especially as a luxury brand, no matter big or small, you're not gonna be able to shoot videos with your phone. You can shoot videos that are very social. You can shoot great videos that look like they were shot with a phone, but you're not gonna shoot it with your phone. <laughs> and so that's a fact, unfortunately, like the, there is a certain cost to, to be able to enter here and operate. That being said, uh, if we try to still rationalize somehow that approach, I think that not all the platforms at the market entry stage obviously should be treated with the same level of opportunity. And I think that WeChat is a fantastic platform, but WeChat is completely over-considered by brands that are at the awareness building stage. Uh, and WeChat is a very costly platform to operate. Platforms like Sha Hongshu, platforms like Weibo are gonna be much more cost efficient. A platform like Douyin is going to be expensive as well. And if you cannot go there and operate your own channels, start with your seeding strategies, start with influencers, 
operate on very minimum presence just to capture their interest, but then spend your budget on people that will speak louder than you. Um, that's how I would approach it. And, and, and also don't think that e-commerce is profitable overnight. So it's gonna come at a cost, but before you reach a certain level of brand equity, it's gonna be difficult. Uh, WeChat commerce relies on the quality and the, the quantity of the audience you've, you've built. Tmall requires a certain level of brand equity to be profitable as well. So, so it, it requires a very rational approach, requires stage approach, requires to not get burned on over investing on content and infrastructure, even though it's great, because without being able to invest on, on media, unfortunately, it's going to be hard to stand out. Choose your platform wisely. I think that's the same in the West. There's clearly times of eventually. Yeah. Choose your platform and the time wisely. And um, we are almost out of time, but Ben, please do share what your thoughts are in, in, in how the industry can learn from others, perhaps. Yeah, absolutely. So the fashion industry is very expansive, um, but I think historically, both the sports fashion, fast fashion, which is generally newer, luxury fashion has been driven by art and intuition, and. On one side, I think the sports fashion brands have done a tremendous job of looking at the vast amount of data and the democratization of content by consumers and really integrated that within the organization from marketing through to uh, corporate affairs to innovation. On the luxury side, some brands have integrated a lot in terms of marketing, but there's still this question, I think, of where does innovation come from in the industry? Who owns new concepts? Who owns new trends? Um, and regardless of this, AI-enabled consumer intelligence is an incredible tool to just be able to watch what's out there. And it's an essential tool that is going to be onboarded by every leading brand. Um, you know, we talked before about a quote um, HBI mentioned that 75% of the major uh, Fortune 100 brands were going to be extinct in a few years because of disruption from AI. Um, and a lot of this has to do with innovation. So I encourage brands to you know, on, on Linkfluence, we have a maturity model approach. Um, start where you are, take the maturity model test. And uh, everything that, uh, everything that we, we recommend is also based on where you are in that model from pricing all the way through to the software and everything else. And that's really the best way to look at it. Brands need to start where they are, but really look at the opportunity. And there's no reason to shy away from that uh, because it seems accessible or intimidating. Thank you so much. Those are fantastic words to end on. Thank you both so much for your time. Thank you everyone for tuning in. And um, I've certainly learned a lot today. So thank you both very much for sharing your insights so generously with the community. Um, please do stay tuned for more BOF Live um, programming coming up soon. And we will be writing up the key insights from this talk on BOF soon. So please do look out for that. Ben, Pablo, thank you so much. Have a lovely day. Thank you. Thank you. you